we're going to be discussing hypotheses and t-tests. So for hypothesis testing, what we're doing is we're actually using inferential statistics and inferential statistics compare two competing hypotheses about the population parameters. A null hypothesis is always going to be that nothing is happening, that nothing is going on, that there is possibly no difference between two populations, that there's not uh, one one no correlation between two populations that one one uh, variable does not predict another er variable outcome. So the null hypothesis is always going to be that nothing is going on. So for example, male results and female results do not differ from each other. That's going to be our null hypothesis. Our alternative hypothesis is going to be that something is happening, that for instance males results and female results do differ from each other significantly, that possibly one variable does predict another variable, or that there is a correlation between male results and female results, or between math test scores and science test scores. The null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis are mutually exclusive, so we can only we can only decide on one after we interpret our data, and we use this data to decide which one we're going to accept, for lack of a better term. Our hypothesis testing, we when we write out our results we do not write that we accept the null hypothesis, we simply write that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. In doing so, we're taking the action of accepting the null hypothesis, but we're leaving that open for change because we can never actually prove that the null hypothesis is true. We can disprove a null hypothesis and we can prove an alternative hypothesis, but we cannot prove a null hypothesis. Because of this, we don't want to write that we accept it. We want to write that we fail to reject it. So let me give you an example of what, that, what I'm trying to say here. The null hypothesis, let's just say, is that unicorns do not exist. And the alternative hypothesis is that unicorns do exist. Now, if we go out and we do our research and our observations and we don't see any unicorns, not finding a unicorn does not prove that unicorns do not exist. It can possibly agree with that. It, it, we can agree with the null hypothesis that unicorns don't exist, but we can't prove it. We can, however, disprove the null hypothesis. And in doing so, because of that, we then are proving an alternative. So using that same example, we can go out, we can do our observations, and if we do happen to find a unicorn, this proves that unicorns exist. It also disproves that unicorns do not exist. So, if we were to not see any unicorns, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. This is the same as rejecting the alternative hypothesis. If we reject the null hypothesis, then we are accepting the alternative. We can only calculate probability that the data contradicts a null hypothesis. In order to decide what our probability is, we're going to set our alpha level or our p-value. And I would say that most times people are doing a statistical analysis, they typically set their p-value at 0.05 
and for the purpose of this class it's always going to be 0.05. There are cases and times that people will set a more stringent alpha level and it might be 0.01 or 0.001 but for the purpose of most social sciences it's going to be a value of 0.05. So when we're looking at this scale what we're saying is that this 95 percent anything above 0.05 to 1 we are basically saying that we are going to fail or reject the null hypothesis. We're going to accept the concept of it and we're going to agree to it and that this is what's happening 95 percent of the time. When your p-value is below 0.05 we reject the null hypothesis and this is when we're saying that the null hypothesis is not correct, that something significant is happening. This 5 percent is when something is significant. There is a significant difference between two groups or that there is a significant correlation between two groups or with two groups. So when we start off on our research we assume that the null hypothesis is correct. Then we go out, we gather our data, then we we run our inferential statistics here and we calculate our p-value. If our p-value is greater than 0.05 then the result is not significant. We fail to reject the null hypothesis which also means we are rejecting the alternative hypothesis. If the p-value is less than 0.05 that means our results are significant. We reject the null hypothesis and we accept the alternative hypothesis. And oftentimes when our results are significant we want to determine the direction of them and we'll get into that in a little bit. So sort of to put all this together here, if it is significant, which means our p-value was below 0.05, we might want to specify the direction of how the null hypothesis failed. So as an example, does the average female score differ from the average male score? Well, if it doesn't, if we reject it and they don't equal each other and they are si significantly different, then which score is higher? Is the female score less than the male? or is the female score greater than the male? And we would want to write that into our results. Next we're going to jump into t-tests and t-tests are actually comparing the average scores of two different populations, typically two sample populations. So we have our sample population A in blue here and it shows the distribution and we have our sample population in B here and that's going to show our distribution and what we're comparing is the average score of sample population A which looks to be around 3 and the average score of sample population B which looks to be around 3.8 and we want to know are those significantly different from each other or do they overlap just enough to where they're not different from each other and that's how a t-test is run and there's two types of t-tests. Uh, we've got our paired or dependent t-test and we also have our independent t-tests also known as between subjects. When we set up a paired samples t-test on SPSS, what this screen is telling us is we're going to pick which two we're comparing to see if they are similar or, or significantly different from each other and this one is saying that variable one, our first population, is going to be whatever the scores were from the Born Supremacy, uh, Born Identity movie, and our second variable we're comparing it to the scores of the Casino Royale movie. So this right top line right here is actually running one paired t-test we can run at the same time a second paired t-test and maybe we want to know if there's a difference between the Casino Royale scores 
and the Terminator 2 scores. And this is how it looks on SPSS. So for our example, here's what we made up. Uh, this is our experiment that was made up. The methodology for it is as follows. For this research, participants were shown 15 different movies over a period of three months. And you'll notice there were 20 participants here. And when I write that there were 20 participants, I don't I make sure to put the N in parentheses. I can read this sentence without the parentheses. It's not participants equal 20, N equals 20. Uh, I just want to say participants were shown. And these, these parentheses, the information in this, inside of this parenthetical quote will reflect back and give more specific information about the word it's pertaining to. Let me start over. For this research, participants were shown 15 different movies over a period of three months. Each movie was shown one week apart. Participants filled out consent forms and initial questionnaire regarding demographic information. Participants were then given an identity number to use with their future questionnaires to increase anonymity and data. Immediately after each movie, participants would answer several questions rating their emotions and likes and dislikes about the movie. This is our little made-up experiment. We decided to run a paired sample t-test or a dependent t-test, also known as a within-groups t-test. These are all three the same test uh, in SPSS. And we came up with, we, we ran it accordingly, and we came up with three different output boxes. And our first output box is our descriptive statistics. And these are crucial, and oftentimes people forget how important this is, but this is half of what we, what we need to run statistics. Within this output box, you can see we have the mean. You can see we have the number. Whoops, sorry about that. You can see we have the number, and we have the standard deviation. So, for instance, there was 20 members or participants that watched the movie The Shining, took their questionnaires. Their average score was 16.7. I keep hitting that button. I'm so sorry. There we go. Their average score was 16.7 uh, and their standard deviation was 2.0. And the same 20 people, the same participants, because this is a dependent t-test, the same 20 participants watched The Notebook. Their average rating on that was 21.31, and their standard deviation was 3.5. For the use of this class, for the purpose of this class, we don't need to look at the correlation output box. The third output box was our inferential statistics, or our actual t-statistic, because we did run a paired samples t-test, or a dependent t-test. And you will notice that down here we can see that we have our t-score and our t-score is negative 8.74 but when we write it within our t-statistic sentence we don't use the negative sign. Our degrees of freedom are 19 which you find in the parentheses right after the t that is italicized and our significance is 0 .000. When writing results from SPSS and you have a 0 .000. We never write that. We actually write that the p is less than 0 .001. So when we are using our descriptives or we're describing our results in everyday format, like in a conversation, or even when we summarize our results, we want to use grammar, English, words, and we would say that the shining rating, the, sh the, the shining ratings were lower than the notebook ratings um, because looking at the two averages that they were. Uh, however, writing that up in APA format, we would say that the shining ratings, and then we're going to put in our parenthetical quotes, the mean and the standard deviation were significant or not significant, if it wasn't significant, we would say we're not significant. We're significantly lower than the notebook ratings. And again, we've got our mean and our standard deviation for the notebook, and we have our t-statistic. 
This is crucial. This is our inferential statistic, and it is in the proper format. We can see that we don't have the negative sign. We can see that this is not 000. It is 0 0.001. And there's our t value right there. And this is how we would write that sentence in APA format. You will also notice that the, the M, the SD, the T, the P, any of the abbreviations that are statistical abbreviations are italicized. And you should also notice that there's a space before and after each equal sign. Equals is treated, the equal sign is treated as it is a word, so you would have a space before a word and after a word. You want to be sure and do that with your equal signs. If we wanted to run an independent t-test, or also known as the between groups t-test, uh, we then run a t-test between two groups. But within those two groups, it's not the same participants. It's typically one variable that's divided for some reason, whether it be people above 30 years old and people below 30 years old, or by gender, females and males or by married and not married, but it's, it's, a, it's a group division where participants can't be in both of them. People are either a female or they are a male. They can't be both. They are either married or not married. It's something that divides the group so that the participant is not taking a participation in both scores that are being compared. A dependent test is one group with two variables, and the participants are accounted for in all conditions. And this was sort of like the same 20 people watched The Notebook and the same 20 people watched The Shining, where an independent t-test has two groups for one variable. Participants meet the conditions of only one group. We still need a second variable so that we can tell SPSS how to divide the group but it's the one variable that's divided. Some examples of the independent samples t-test again would be males and females, two different ethnic groups, married, never married, happy, sad, uh, fatality rate versus crash rate. And when we set this up in SPSS format, uh, if, uh, this is a, a picture of not our our little made-up experiment, but just to show you what it looks like. Uh, if we wanted to know if males and females differed in their math abilities, the math aptitude test would be the dependent variable, and the grouping variable would be gender, males and females. And this grouping variable, after we pick that, it, we need to go in and hit define group and if we hit define group, we need to define our groups, whether it be group number one and group number two, group number zero, group number one, female and male. Sometimes it's numbers, sometimes it's, it's words. It depends upon how the data is already in SPSS. Uh, but keep in mind, if you do use something that's got words or a string variable, you need to be very specific about capitalization and spelling. Going back to our little example of the people that went to watch the 15 movies a week apart from each other, we run the, the results. This first top box you can see is our, descri is our descriptives. We've already seen this box. Oh, I apologize. We haven't seen the box for the independent t-test. This is our descriptive box for the independent t-test. And we can see here that there were, my goodness, I keep hitting that button. We can see here that there were 10 males that had an average score of 23.39 and the standard deviation of 3.60. And we had 10 females that watched the notebook and they had an average score of 19.23 with a standard deviation of 2.10. So these are looking at the males and the females and their response to the notebook. In the one before, we included both males and females, and we looked at what these people thought of the notebook compared to the movie The Shining. In this one, 
In the Independent, we're just looking at one movie, The Notebook, and we're seeing if there's a difference between males and females. So again, only 10 participants in each group here because they can't fit into both categories. And the next thing we would get is our second output box, which is our actual t-test or our inferential statistic box. And this one is going to show us two things. It's going to give us our t-test, which starts right here, our t-test. But it's also going to give us our Levine's test. And the Levine's test is comparing the variances between the two groups. Because whenever we run inferential statistics, we make assumptions that the distributions of the populations were similar, they had normal distributions, similar amount of people. Um, we make certain assumptions and Levine's will test whether or not we have met our assumptions or broken our assumptions. You should also notice that there are two t-tests. So this little Levine's box, this is separate. This is on its own. We have our Levine's F statistic and significance. And then our t-tests, we have this one, which is all directly related to equal variances assumed. And we have the equal variances not assumed, which is the bottom row. So there are two results for the same test. And what that's going to depend on is our Levine's test. So it's going to look at our Levine's test and we need to look at significance. If significance is below 0.05, that means that we significantly, we broke assumptions, we did not meet the equal variance, and we need to look at the bottom line. So if it's below 0.05, we look at the bottom line. If this is above 0.05, we look at the top line. It's that simple, but we need to do this step first, first and foremost, before we go on to the T. So this one, you can also kind of go through the questions. Are groups about equal in size? If they are, then you would use equal variance as assumed um, if they did not break any assumptions. Um, if they're equal in size but maybe broke assumptions, then we would find out in Levine's. Is Levine's less than or equal to 0.05? We would use our unequal variances, or the bottom line. And if Levine's is not less than or equal to 5, if it's greater than 0.05, then we would use equal variances. And one more time, this time it is actually below 0.05. We're going to use our bottom row for our information. So how do we write all this up? Well, just for describing the results, remember the mean, the standard deviations, the T, the P, these are all going to be italicized. There's going to be spaces uh, after and before uh, equal sign. And this is the standard way to write the mean and standard deviation for APA format. We never write that P equals 0, 0, 0. And we've also put in here that the male scores were significantly higher. You'll notice the word higher than female scores, not significantly different. Because we can look at them and see that 23.3 is higher than 19.2. So we put the word higher in. But there is a little bit more we need to to write when we write up our results. This paragraph is the way that we want to write results. We're going to write that an independent samples t-test was run to see if gender had an influence on movie preference using gender as the independent variable and movie preference as the dependent variable. Results indicated that gender had a significant influence on movie preference with males, and we have our descriptives, scoring significantly higher than females. And, our, and we have our descriptives for females. And then we have our t-statistic. And these would be tables in a normal paper. You would label your tables. This research would reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference between genders on movie preference. 
So it shows right here where the numbers are coming from. We can see our descriptive statistics, our inferential statistics. First thing I do, I look at Levine's. I choose it's below 0.03, so I'm going to go equal variance is not assumed. And this is what I'm going to use for my t-score. This is where I got it. Here's where I get my descriptive statistics for males and for females. And here is a color-coded way to break down what it is I'm writing. So I have acknowledged that an independent samples t-test was run. This is the type of statistical analysis that was performed. If I'd run an ANOVA, I would put ANOVA. If I'd run a correlation, I would put correlation, a Pearson's product correlation. Uh, was run to see if gender had an influence on movie preference using gender as the independent variable and movie preference as the dependent variable. And right there, I have acknowledged what my independent and dependent variables are. Results indicated that gender had a significant, and I say whether it's significant or not significant, influence on movie preference with males, and I have my descriptives, and females, and I have my descriptives. And because sometimes these are different numbers, uh, they're two different groups, I could have had 14 males and 6 females, you don't know, but I put a small n here to show my subpopulation, to show my smaller population. Um, I added that to my descriptives. And then I have my t-score, or my inferential statistic. Uh, then I want to state whether or not we reject or fail to reject the null. I want to state what I'm doing with my hypothesis. And I also want to explain again what the null hypothesis was. The null hypothesis, so I'm, ex I'm rejecting the null hypothesis that there was no difference between genders on movie preference. And this is the very best way that you can write up a t-test. It's got everything. Other people reading it know exactly what they're looking at. It's, it becomes a very common language. When I'm interpreting this, just to remind ourselves, a significant t-test means that the two population means or averages probably differ. A, sig a significant t-test does not mean that the difference between these two groups is necessarily important, and it does not mean that the difference between the two groups is large. It just means that it's, it exists and that it is not due to chance. Basically that everyone in the group with the larger mean had higher scores than everyone in the group with smaller mean, on average. Some of the assumptions that I was talking about, um, the mean is appropriate for quantifying the average of the dependent variable. The dependent variable needs to be ratio or interval. The dependent variable has a normal symmetrical distribution. The in order to have the normal distribution, um, it, that's needed so that we can actually calculate our P, our T, and our degrees of freedom. We're also assuming that the scores are independent of each other, that one doesn't feed into the next one, that each, per, each participant provides one pair of scores for the dependent t-test or one score for the independent t-test. Uh, for the independent t-test, the independent variable or the grouping variable is nominal with two levels. This is in order to run a t-test. Um, if we had more than two levels, we would be running an ANOVA. And we don't change ratio, interval, or ordinal to nominal. And this is just to look at for your own use. If you're wondering which t-test to use, you can just sort of, sort of uh, start. If you start up here at the top, how many levels does the independent variable have? If it has more than two, then you need to stop and a t-test isn't going to work. If it has two, then what type of variable is the dependent variable? If your dependent variable is nominal or ordinal, then you need to stop. You can't use a t-test. If your dependent variable is interval or ratio, then we can keep going. Does the dependent variable have a unimodal distribution, normal distribution? 
If it's no, nope, can't use the t-test. If it's yes, then we can keep going. Does the dependent variable have a normal distribution? Um, if it's no, then you might want to consider something else. If it's yes, how many scores does every participant provide? So if all the, part if the participants provided two scores, we would use our dependent paired samples, such as the first one where the 20 participants watched movie A and watched movie B. If, it, if each participant provides one score, a female watched a movie versus the males that watched the movie, then we would use our independent. These are all sort of saying the same thing, but some people I think we all learn a little bit differently. So I just wanted to give this to you all uh, so you could figure out which t-test you wanted to use and what the heck you were doing. Hope you have a great day. Thanks.